All right, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, so yeah, we're here to tell the story of the fall of Constanti Constantinople, the end, not Istanbul. Uh, now, to put that earworm in your head. Uh, so this was the last capital of the Roman Empire. Now, modern historians talk about the Byzantine Empire, but that Byzantine was a term that, that didn't really exist until hundreds of years after the fall of Constantinople. The people who lived there thought of themselves as the Romans, as the heirs to the Eastern Roman Empire, which had about uh, in 300 uh, AD split off from the Western Roman Empire. Now, the West fell into the Dark Ages fairly quickly after that, but the East uh, thrived for a while, peaking in around the 10th century, uh, and then went into a long period of decline. And by the 1450s, uh, this was all that was left, uh, a bit of land around Constantinople and uh, a small section of southern Greece, and that was as far as the Roman Empire got, surrounded by the Ottomans. The city itself had fallen on fairly hard times. Uh, it was once uh, filled with uh, fantastic buildings, great riches, but by the, the 1450s, there was very little left. It was basically a series of towns and villages that were uh, all, all inside the, uh, the Great Walls, uh, with many fields where there once were, were great buildings. Uh, most of it was in disrepair. But while it was a bit of a fixer-upper, it still had location, location, location. <laughs> it was on the Bosphorus between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean. It was where the uh, Silk Road came from Asia, met Europe. It was something that was still very coveted, and the Ottomans saw it like an apple ready for the plucking. So, yeah, the Constantinople uh, city residents, the Romans, they knew this. They knew they were in trouble, and they were desperate to try and find a way to, to protect themselves. One of the things they spent a lot of effort doing in uh, the years leading up to 1450 was trying to reunify the, the church, the Catholic and Orthodox church. They had split 500 years earlier, and they wanted to reunify them to try and get some help from the Latin West. This was not particularly successful, but they were, they were doing their best, and they thought, and they thought they got, what, they got they what they thought was a break. In 1451, the Sultan, the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire passed on, and his and young son, a 17-year-old kid, came to power. Okay, okay. okay. Just, a kid, just a kid, he's going to need a consolidating power. power. We've got, got a little bit of a break here. And, and not, so not so much. So when, so when Mehmed, Mehmed came to power, power, power he, he almost immediately, immediately decided to take the maneuvers around to Constantinople. He built this fortress, a luminelli fortress, just way up the way on the Bosphorus Strait, cutting off the possibility of being from the north. The news was, news was tightening. tightening. So, let's, so introduce let's introduce our, our antagonist here. here. Uh, on the right, on the right corner, we have Sultan, Sultan Mehmet. He is a young, young, vicious, vicious brilliant, brilliant. He's got he's tremendous, tremendous resources, resources ready to change, change the world. The world. On the left corner, we've, we've got, got Constantine, Constantine the 11. 11. He's older, older, older more experienced, experienced, not so much in the way of resources, resources but he has but one ace in his hole, which is which that, is that time. time. Eventually, Eventually, he can stand, stand a siege, siege. the way the Latin, Latin uh, city states come, come to his aid and be able to break that siege. He's got one other ace, General Gustiani, who is a Genovese general, showed up to help save the city with a battalion man, very experienced soldier. So with that, with that, the siege began. 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 But they had one they problem. One thing, one thing that, that Constantinople, Constantinople had that no other city had. The walls. the walls. These were the These marvel were the of the time, the time right? This was the, the, the pinnacle, pinnacle of medieval, medieval wall technology. It had three layers, it had a moat and multiple towers. It had never been breached. The city had fallen for other things like treachery and so on, but the walls were solid, and they repaired them, they did what they could, they bricked up various gates, they got them ready to stop any attack. But one new technology had recently arrived from the Far East, gunpowder. So enter science. Orban the Hungarian, who was actually Hungarian, Orban uh, was a cannon maker, and he, uh, he went, first he came over to Constantinople and said, hey, I would like to be your cannon maker, and Constantine was like, great. Uh, but unfortunately, Constantine was, well, kind of bankrupt, uh, and was unable to pour, pay Orban regularly. So Orban was like, this is, this is no good, I like to get paid. And he went over to Mehmet over in the Ottoman Empire and said, hey, can you help me out? And Mehmet was like, yeah. Um, <laughs> 
So I said, can you build me the largest cannon the world has ever seen? And the guy was like, yeah, absolutely. I'll build you a cannon that would shake the walls of Babylon herself. So he built this thing. This is actually a 1464 copy out of the same mold, but uh, it's about this size, 27 feet long, 37,000 pounds, and it could shoot a rock over a mile. So they brought this to the siege, brought thousands and thousands of troops to the siege, and began the bombardment. The problem was the cannons were not very good at this time. It could only fire seven times a day because it was uh, a little hard to reload. And at night, Gustiani and Constantine would rebuild the walls, filling in the gaps. They had to unbrick one of the uh, uh, portals in order to do this, but nevertheless, they were able to hold on for a while. And then the greatest hope for the defenders, the greatest fear for the, the Ottomans, over the horizon to the south came a flotilla of ships bearing the Genoese flag, pushed forward by a great southern wind, moving towards the city in the safety of the Golden Horn. The Ottomans, they were rowing as hard as they could against the wind, but it looked like the, the, the ships were going to make it. But then, just as they were about to turn into the safety of the Golden Horn, going past the chain, the wind died. The defenders uh, were on the city walls looking at the situation, couldn't believe it. They thought that they were absolutely in a, the worst way possible. But then their hopes, their prayers, the wind from God arrived, pushed the ships into the harbor, passed the chain, and the city, for now, was saved. This really upset Mehmet. But he's not something to take something lying down. So he came with an idea. He had to get into that harbor. It was blocked by a chain. Forget about it. He built a series of pulleys and chains and brought the ships over land, over the top, and into the harbor from behind. Great. This worked out very well. So now six, uh, the, the number of miles the defenders had to defend went from three to six. It was a tremendous advantage. Went and attacked the walls again, but still couldn't get through. Said, OK, we got to do something more. Well, if we can't go over the walls, it's time to go under. So uh, the Ottoman side had some Serbian silver miners who were actually from Saxony. And on the uh, defender's side, we had John from Germany, who was actually Scottish. <laughs> and so the Serbians were going to dig in their tunnels on the Marne, and then John would listen, hear them digging, dig a countermine, jump on top of them, bring out probably the last military use of the original Greek fire, and burn them out. It was terrible. The mines were not working. There had to be something more. But, and at this point, they're trying to, the, the uh, Ottomans are pushing against the walls. They're getting turned out. Morale is getting long. But something came from the heavens. It was a full moon, but then all of a sudden, the moon got darker and darker until it showed a crescent moon. This was a symbol of Islam, the Ottoman flag. They knew this was a sign from God that they were going to be victorious. But it got worse than that. Two days later, the sky was lit as if it, the, the, the city was lit up as if lighted by fire. Uh, a witness described looking at Hagia Sophia, the largest cathedral in all Christendom, and they saw a flame rising from the sky, going up into the air as if the Spirit of God was leaving the city. They were, they were terribly, terribly disappointed by this uh, sign. Now, in the light of history, with a little bit of science, uh, we were able to determine what really happened here was that a volcano exploded in the South Pacific in Vanuatu in 1453, and these effects in the sky were likely the after effects of that volcanic explosion. For, but for the people at the time, this was clearly a sign from God, and it was time to go. So it geared up for the final assault. Now at this point, the siege had been going on for months. Mehmet knew this was a do or die moment. If he wasn't able to get the siege through, uh, then his troops would go home. He would be the laughing stock of Ottomandom and probably lose his sultancy. Constantine knew that if he didn't win this one, everybody in the city was gonna be enslaved and dead. So he had a lot of an incentive to go as well. So they threw it all into the breach. They were fighting and fighting, couldn't quite make it through. Then a Mehmet saying, I think quite colorfully, go on my falcons, march on my lions. He threw his janissaries, his strongest troops, into the breach for one last chance to take it out. 
On the other side, Giovanni Gostiani and Constantine were fighting inside a, uh, between the inner and outer wall, which was, looked like this. And what they had done is to make sure people, you know, kept their morale up, didn't, uh, they locked the door behind them, so there was no retreat. <laughs> but then, Gostiani fell. He got hit by maybe, the stories vary. Some people say he was a crossbow belt, some people it was an exploding thing, whatever. He went down and Constantine noted, this was his general who had fought, who had done, who had done so much for the city. Said, you know what, we gotta get this guy out of here, make him you know, a chance to live. We're gonna unlock this gate and let him go through. This turned out not to be a very good idea because at the same time, one of the unlocked gates that they had made for attacking the city was left behind. About 50 Ottoman soldiers went into the Kirkaporto, a postern gate, and fought their way to the top. Now, it really militarily wasn't that significant. They were soon surrounded and destroyed, but before they were, they raised the Ottoman flag on top of one of the towers. The defenders saw that flag on a distant tower. They figured all was lost, started fleeing through the gate that uh, they had opened for Gistiani, Constantine, he said to himself, the city is lost, but I am still alive. He decided to change that situation and went immediately into battle, fighting to the end. And he actually, his body was never been found. There are legends that, uh, in fact, uh, uh, he had disappeared into, into the walls and will return again when it was time for the uh, return of Constantinople to uh, its rightful owners from their point of view. So... Mehmed earned his name. He became Mehmed the Conqueror. He got in the city. It was after three days of a sack. The sack was very brutal. These things were not very good at the time. Probably 30,000 people were, were brought into slavery. A lot of people were killed. But after the three days, Mehmed said, all right, anyone who survived the sack, anyone who made it, you're welcome back. You can come take your property back. He welcomed in uh, people of all faiths. If they were willing to pay the tax, they could come back to the city and rebuilt Constantinople from the, from the ground up to be the great city we know as Istanbul. This, however, was not satisfactory to everybody. A lot of the Greeks who were there, who were part of the intelligentsia, they moved to, to Italy, to Western Europe, and were a critical aspect of starting the, uh, the Renaissance. So from that, from that uh, transition, we lost one empire, and we gained the Renaissance, knowledge, humanism, science for the world. So I'd like to raise a toast to transitions from one thing to moving on to a better.